Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, tomorrow is, of course, Independence Day here in our country. And I thought we might begin by talking a little together about public prayer. The following private prayer was offered by a college student taking calculus. Oh Lord, hear my anxious plea. Calculus is killing me. <laughs> I know not of the X or the Y and probably won't until the day I die. Please, Lord, help me in this hour as I take my ease, my case to the highest power. I care not for fame or loot, just help me find one square root. <laughs> and Lord, please let me see one passing mark in organic chemistry. Oh, such a thing I constantly dread, I just as soon join the Marines instead. Lord, please give me a sign that you'll be listening all the time. Please lead me out of this constant coma and give me a shot at my diploma. <laughs> and people say there's no prayer in school. Back in February, our youth group participated in World Vision's 30-hour fountain. I was reflecting on that this week, well, coincidentally, as an anniversary of the first time I came to you. The first Sunday I stood here was last year at this time, this Sunday. And so I started looking back and looked at last year's 30-hour famine. And we began the 30-hour famine experience by asking the youth to write down their answer to a few questions on poster boards around this very room that you're sitting in. Faced with 30 consecutive hours of not being able to eat, an answer to the question, what are you worried about? Three of the eight responses were about their grades in school. And during our closing activity at hour 30, Four of the eight responses to the question, what are you hungry for spiritually, were just two simple words. Good grades. Imagine that. After 30 hours of voluntarily starving themselves to raise money for hungry kids, and the thing that tops the list of spiritual desires for our youth is still good grades. Now, I don't bring this up to belittle our youth in any way, but rather to reveal to us the importance of what happens in school in the lives of the youngest generation. Every time we hear politicians talk about prayer in schools, they seem to be asserting that prayer doesn't already exist there. Many people will cite the separation of church and state and the First Amendment of our Constitution to claim that prayer has no place in the public sphere. So in the spirit of celebrating our country's freedom, I thought I'd share some of the research I did on the topic this week with you. Contrary to the way that you may hear about it spoken about on television, there is no provision preventing students from engaging in personal or small group prayer in school, as long as participation in such is voluntarily chosen by the students and does not impose on the rights of others. So for example, while gathering all the students together in a mandatory assembly and then praying together is out, Students are free to gather for prayer and even Bible study during or after school in any of the school's clubs that are considered non if any of the school's clubs rather are considered non-curriculum clubs under the Equal Access Act of 1984. If that's the case, then they can utilize that same they can create their own school clubs for religious purposes. So the trick then becomes finding an advisor. Overcoming the misconception that such clubs don't belong in school, and learning how to work together with people whose Christian domination may differ than on their own, such as the nature of all religious work. But sisters and brothers, our world is changing. Our world has become a lot scarier than it used to be, amen? amen. We have placed into the hands of every person the tools of uncensored, expanded <coughs> influence, while the capacity of an individual to affect others through actions of mass violence have increased, or at least remained the same. This has allowed terrorist groups, hate groups, and individuals with mental illnesses to reap harvests of greater damage than they've ever been capable of before. In days past, access to such destructive power was relegated to the hands of those in power, who usually had to answer to others, at least in some capacity. At the same time, as the United States has become more religiously diverse in the past several decades, school-sponsored proselytizing has been deemed out of bounds. But because schools occupy the majority of a child's day, to strip it of, this, of, spirituality, of spirituality completely would be to remove one of the few coping mechanisms available to our students. When we feel powerless, is there not power in being able to pray? Jesus, I believe, would want for us to allow prayer in our schools in some capacity. 
while forcing students to recite prayers offered by people of other faith traditions may violate, indeed, their personal rights. Does it truly violate the religious rights of others to listen to others praying in their own tradition? Does it injure my soul to listen to a Muslim praying for our community's health and safety when ISIS attacks Istanbul or we see shootings in Orlando? What effect might it have for a Muslim to hear a Christian student praying for racial equality and a reformation of our prison system in Jesus' name? And is there a reason why an atheist cannot bear to listen to others pray? Jesus sent out his disciples ahead of him in the scripture reading this morning as he planned to visit them. They were to travel light, without so much as a wallet, a bag, or even sandals. And whenever they came to a house, rather than sharing a theological treatise or demanding that they say a specific prayer accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior, the disciples were told simply to go and say, May peace be on this house. If anyone there shares God's peace, then your peace will rest on that person, and if not, your blessing will return to you. Make no mistake, these disciples were Jesus' first ambassadors, but they weren't told to indoctrinate, they were told to offer them God's peace. And if they accepted it, God's peace would remain with them. The disciples were told to accept whatever they needed, but not to become a burden on those that they visited. Remain in the house, Jesus said, eating and drinking whatever they said before you, for workers deserve their pay. Rather than burdening them, we are to elevate them, providing a link to the source of all God's restorative power, healing the people in every way conceivable. But, and this is the crux of it, regardless of whether or not the disciples find themselves accepted, they are to remind people that God's kingdom has come to those they encountered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So whether God's offered peace is welcomed or rejected, each person who encounters it should know that the kingdom of God was there. Amen? Amen. In other words, whenever we offer the world, church, whatever we offer them, it better be good news. Church, say, we've got good news. We've got good news. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, he notes how he has begun to write in the ancient equivalent of all caps which is rude for those of you that write in all caps all the time online, so don't do that. <laughs> and, but why? Why was Paul so worked up? Paul is complaining because people who want to stuff feathers in their own caps are demanding that, they may be, that these people be circumcised and to follow the Jewish law. Paul is irate because to him, being circumcised or uncircumcised doesn't mean anything, he writes. What matters is a new creation. And watch this. May peace and mercy be on whoever follows this rule and on God's Israel. Paul wants the Jesus movement he's a part of to continue to be about peace and mercy. He yearns for it to remain about being about a new creation in the world, instead of simply being another way to impose a new set of rules on people. Sisters and brothers, we keep coming up with new ways to become a burden to people instead of helping them to recognize that God's kingdom has come upon you. Say that, church. God's kingdom has come upon you. Jesus' followers today have become too concerned with their own survival. Let me show you some examples. From my personal book collection. I'll save those two for last. This shows you where the church's mindset is at. This book is called Renovate or Die. It's not for the trustees. <laughs> this one's called I Refuse to Lead a Dying Church. This one was brought by the denomination to a local uh, church clergy gathering a few years back. And this one was from the first church I served as an assistant pastor. They had a split in the church and they were wondering, this is the answer to this question, can our church live? And this one's for me. It's called Preventing Ministry Failure. <laughs> I would rather leave these books behind and think instead about your church can thrive. Amen. Bearing fruit. Amen? Amen. Yeah, yeah. See, that's where we're at. Right, church? Right. So that's where we're going. But our church as a whole is more concerned about survival 
And in church, sometimes we worry about our civil rights more being violated more than we are concerned with sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Churches today are quicker to ask the community to support us than to say that we have come to support you. We get more upset that our children are not allowed to pray in school assemblies because it seems we've been forced out than we do that our children are being prevented from praying together for this broken world of ours. Now tomorrow we will celebrate this country's Independence Day, a day set aside by people here in the United States to rejoice in the freedom that we have been entrusted with by those who fought for it. But the best way to celebrate this freedom is not just to preserve it, but rather to use it. We keep trying, our, tying ourselves to, say, a form of religion, more in the ways that it no longer works the way it used to, instead of making Jesus the sole anchor and foundation of our faith. Rather than complaining about the ways that we've been prohibited from sharing God's peace, let us make full use of the ways that remain. Let's share the good news of Jesus Christ, church, that God's kingdom is right here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's get out there and share God's good news that the peace of Christ has come to you. Praise God. Praise God. And let's let them know by the way that we live and by the way that we teach and by the way that we serve and by the way that we love above all else that the kingdom of God has come near to you this day. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the mission and the call of Christians in today's world, not to indoctrinate, not to legislate, but rather to show the love of Jesus Christ in this world by the way that we are in this world. We have a love in Jesus Christ to share, and that church is good news. And it's as simple as, and say this with me, peace be with you. Peace, peace be with you. Peace be with you as well, church, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.